Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Wyant, the founder and editor of AgriPulse, and are really pleased to have you with us this afternoon. Our topic today is important for anyone trying to bring new and innovative products to market. Our theme is understanding the California regulatory environment and your role in bringing new technology to market. As some of you know, we launched a California version of AgriPulse four years ago. And one thing that has become abundantly clear is that there's a very high regulatory bar to pass in California. And that's on top, of course, of what is happening at the federal level. So we are very keenly aware of all the challenges that both crop protection companies and growers face in this kind of environment. At the same time, we have consumers across the globe who are looking for products that are safer and easier to use and more uh, at the same time being effective. So I can't underscore how important this topic is today and that we have a better understanding of it. So I'd like to uh, introduce some of our speakers to you in a little bit, and then we'll have facilitated questions and answers. After I make their introductions, I really encourage you to dig into their full biographies on our website. We also want to hear from you, the attendees. So please offer any questions that you might have on the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat box, just the Q&A, please. If you are experiencing any technical issues, just let us know. We'll let our Zoom rep uh, indicate how they can help you and use the Q&A function there as well. In addition, we'll be recording today's session, so you'll be able to watch it a little later on at agropulse.com. So to start out, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this webinar, and that's BASF. Thank you for making this possible. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Mary Freisinski is the State Regulatory Affairs Manager with BASF's North American Regulatory Affairs Department. She is primarily responsible for working with the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, DPR, to secure and maintain registration for BASF's agricultural solutions products. Fryzinski is also actively a participant in the Western Plant Health Regulatory Affairs Committee. She has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a minor in genetics from North Carolina State University. So welcome, Mary. And she's gonna be joined in our first session with Dr. Kevin Caffrey. He is a technical services representative for BASF serving the Southern San Joaquin Valley. For his first three years with BASF, Caffrey assisted the Mid-South business focusing on soybeans, cotton, rice, sugarcane, corn, and various other associated crops, where he supported various product launches, including Engenia herbicide, Provisia herbicide and rice and trait package, and added expansions to the BASF portfolio across all major sectors, including Servia, Savia in fun, fungicide versus insecticide and Safina insecticide, as well as dozens of label amendments. Caffrey graduated from North Carolina State University with a PhD in biological and agricultural engineering. So first up, I'd like to welcome Mary for your presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Today, we will give you an overview of the pesticide registration process, an update on the current regulatory environment, and what we can do as an industry to be more effective in this environment. I will be speaking to you based on my experience working within this process for the past eight years to register BASS products in California. Next slide. Apologies, oh, slight technical. There we go. We understand there are many overarching issues in California agriculture, and most have a regulatory component. Today, we are going to focus on pesticide registration and opportunities for collaboration. Next slide. 
first, let me take you through the last 10 years and how regulatory challenges have impacted registration timelines. In 2014, PANA challenged DPR's acceptance of two dinutefron label amendments. Dinutefron was part of the neonicotinoid reevaluation initiated in 2009. The lawsuit alleged DPR violated the California Environmental Equality Act or CEQA, by approving label amendments without sufficient environmental review. As part of CEQA compliance, DPR issues weekly notice of decisions posted for public comment. In 2017, the courts ruled and found DPR's notice of decision and public reports deficient under CEQA. In order to retain compliance, DPR implemented a new process, which I'll highlight on the next slide. The court was troubled by DPR's decision to expand use of dinutefron while undergoing reevaluation. And in 2018, DPR issued a policy to not act upon submissions of new or expanded use of an active ingredient under reevaluation. The neonicotinoid risk determination was completed later that year. Scientists reviewing registrations also work on special projects such as the risk determination, taking time away from registration reviews. We experienced an increase in the time to register new conventional active ingredients from two to three years to over four years. Although I will say we have seen some recent improvements. Please note conventional active ingredients are only a subset of the range submissions DPR reviews and have the largest data sets and require the most extensive review. Adding to all of this, the sudden shift to working remotely in 2020 saw some short-term delays as the department adapted and it became challenging to hire and train new staff. Staffing issues continue today with a smaller applicant pool as there are fewer qualified applicants willing to relocate. All of these challenges have had an impact on the review process and timelines. Next slide. DPR's notice of decision and public report are part of the certified regulatory program under CEQA. And to address the court's concern and protect certified program status, DPR revised internal processes, including a public report for each submission addressing each of these six areas you see. Resources were needed to create a new public report station and DPR acknowledged impacts to registrants, including delays while public reports are being created and additional routing if the checklist areas cannot be justified. In addition to new submissions, the process impacted products already under review and label amendments to existing products. When this was communicated in 2019, we didn't know what to expect and I have been impressed with how well DPR and its staff have implemented it. Next slide. <clears throat> Despite the challenges, BASF has continued to work through the regulatory process and register new technology in California. Safinas, Safina and scallus insecticide containing the new active ingredient, aphidopyrifin, was registered in June, 2020 one of the first conventional active ingredients approved across the industry since 2017. Since registration, we have received approval on several label expansions, including tree nuts. Sevia fungicide containing the new active ingredient, mefentrifluconazole, was registered in October 2021, with subsequent label expansions approved earlier this year. We continue to work within the regulatory process in California to bring new and innovative solutions to California agriculture. Next slide. Speaking of solutions, let's take a step back and look at new product development. As you can see in this graphic from CropLife America, the number of new active ingredients being introduced is declining. This is due to increasing regulatory hurdles, extended review timelines, and increasing development cost. Next slide. 
Here's a look at the significant time and resources that go into preparing a registration package. It can take 11 years or longer to develop and register a new pesticide, which includes seven more, or more years of extensive development and research to register safe and effective products. Please do note, this does not include the time to register in the states, which means an additional 18 months or more in California. California agriculture is one to two years behind the country receiving new technology. Next slide. This simple schematic is an overview of the registration process, both federally and in California. Data conducted according to EPA's test guidelines are submitted to both agencies and each conducts a thorough scientific evaluation of human health and environmental effects from use of the product. In addition, California requires certain data conducted in California-like conditions. California reviews all of the data according to EPA's guidelines and with special considerations to the state's unique environmental and agricultural concerns. Missing information and poorly written labels can cause unnecessary delays. At BASF, we understand the importance of preparing high quality submission packages, and we are very responsive throughout the evaluation process to ensure our labels promote safe and effective use of our products. Next slide. This slide highlights the difference between the Section 3 master label and the printed container label. The master label contains all approved uses, crops, and rates reviewed and accepted by EPA. The states, including California, review the printed container label attached to the product. Registrants have some discretion on removing uses and pests, but cannot remove restrictions. This printed label is the law and must be followed by the user. California does have state-specific requirements which must be addressed on the label. Everything on the label, including anything specific to California, must also be reviewed and accepted by EPA on the master label. Now I'll turn it over to Kevin to discuss other label types and stakeholder involvement. Hey, everybody. I'm Kevin Caffrey, um, like they introduced. I guess the one point that wasn't introduced was <laughs> I've been in California for five or six years now. Um, I'm, I'm one of the on the ground people. So my boots get pretty muddy walking almond fields, carrots, what have you. Um, so if you can hop to the next slide, I'll get into some of the different uh, other sections. Um, I guess the other mention is when you hear sections, like a section three label, a section 18, like I'll talk about right now, um, that's actually sections of FIFRA, which is the federal, essentially the federal act that governs registration. So when you hear these sections, it's actually sections of a federal law. Um, section 18, you hear these, the emergency exemptions. Um, many times people are hopping to these like, hey, we need something quick. These are actually pretty tough to get. Um, it is something I will say, though, on the ground from a PCA, from a commodity group, this comes from all of you. If there is a key need, um, a new pest showing up, that's going to cause significant economic harm to a crop. This is where you submit an emergency exemption to the state. Um, and they may be able to allow um, through EPA to allow the use for a short period of time. Um, the primary one we use are specific. This is for a certain crop, certain pest, um, with the mindset that at the same time, they'll be pushing for a regular registration. Um, quarantine does come up sometimes in agriculture. This is where there's an invasive pest that we desperately need something to control it or it's gonna take over the, our, our environment, whether it's crop or other, other issues like homes and such. That's kind of where quarantine comes in. Public health, just think of mosquitoes. Um, and then certainly crisis is really, really fast track. Um, so this is a, an, an option if there's something major happening that nothing's registered for, there's no options. California is pretty strict with these, um, but they definitely go through when there's a need. They just have to be properly reviewed. Um, so next slide. So another one you hear about are SLNs, special local needs. Um, this falls under your section 24C of FIFRA. Um, essentially what this is, is allowing state specific changes to the EPA label. That's a simple way to put it. Um, states are allowed to make labels, as Mary mentioned, on the container more restrictive. That's why many times you see things like not for use in California or certain rate ranges, differences. That's separate from SLN. SLNs are more about some special local need that's a little bit different. Um, a good example, we have a number of SLNs in onions that allow some of our uses a little earlier than the container label 
because there's a special need in certain counties in California um, where that's very important. Um, these are also pretty rigorous, but again, these come from the ground. Um, these are being initiated by the university. These are being initiated by grower groups. Um, BASF can initiate them, but many times California, and we actually prefer whenever the grower groups or commodity groups initiate these, it's just a stronger argument overall. And really that's where they're coming from. There's a special need for this geography and it has to be slightly different than the label. Um, it can't be a major difference, but again, when it comes to different timings and some things like that, um, that's really where 24 C's come in. Uh, next slide. Uh, section 2 E actually in FIFRA gives exceptions to itself. So it says, hey, there's these minor things that can be changed without having to follow all the rigorous registration processes. Um, these are pretty straightforward. They're things like dosage reduction. Um, if we wanna reduce our use rate lower than what it currently is, we can do that. Um, if we wanna add a pest, we can add a pest if we have significant data. Um, this is one that California asks for data. Um, they can request it at any time. Many times we just submit it. Um, it's always better to submit it ahead of time and say, hey, we have this data that's California or California-like that's statistically significant to show that we have activity on this key pest. So if the product's already registered on the crop and you get new data for a certain pest, that's many times where two double E's come in. Um, so it's, it's specific restrictions, uh, ex exceptions, I should say, um, that are a little easier to get through. And this is just minor changes to the label, essentially. And again, many of these, and I push lots of these through, and these really come from all of you on the ground. I would know what targets to look at and then pull the data together to make some of these changes. So a lot of this comes to the collaboration with grower groups, growers, PCAs to find what targets we need with our product. Next slide. And then section 32, um, it actually creates the minor use program. And the major minor use program that hopefully all of you are aware of is the IR4 program. The IR4 program is fantastic. Um, what this is is essentially uh, federal and state funds that allow registrations of what they consider minor, minor acre crops. So you're not gonna do IR4 projects on corn or soybeans, but when you come down to something even like lettuce or a good example would be like avocados, there's a number of projects going through now and it's a process to be able to register new products. Uh, many of these crops, when it comes to a large company, BSF being one of them, when we start looking at the books and justifying the expense of registration, all the other processes, it's hard for any for-profit organization to justify it. But that's where IR4 can step in and say, hey, you know, these are important for these crops. These are important. We're going to help some of this residue cost. We're going to help some of this crop safety and efficacy cost and get this through working with the registrant. Um, the other nice thing is California puts in additional funds for California-specific projects. Um, it's a great program. I don't think enough people know about it. Um, it's actually relatively easy to even put in an application to request um, IR4 to look into a project for a key pest, for a key crop, for a key active ingredient. Um, so I definitely tell people, use the IR4 program. Um, we should be using every cent that's available and asking for more. This is a fantastic program. Next slide. So and again, like I mentioned for some of the other stuff, it all comes to working together. Um, I've got a few key examples of this that I've, I've dealt with just in the last few years that really showed the industry coming together to help some of these registrations. A key example is Sevia fungicide. Um, as was mentioned, well, our new, newest fungicide just was registered recently. Um, a number of the major UC plant pathologists wrote letters to CalDPR in support of this, pro this product. Um, there are some other fungicides that are similar, but this product with its ecotox profile, its efficacy, a number of other really positive parts of the new active ingredient, UC professors said, hey, this is significantly better. We need this product. We can't just let it go through the process. We need it as quick as we can. Um, that's one great example with a collaboration with the UC system where they see the important need in the industry and can help push it through. Uh, Safina is another key example, our newest insecticide. Um, it's a great insecticide, it has a great ecotox, it's soft and beneficials. It really checks all the boxes that we're looking for with new insecticide. Very targeted, um, just an overall great product. And a number of commodity groups, a number of growers during the nod process, the notice of decision, they wrote lots of positive comments around Safina saying, telling 
Cal DPR, we really want this product. And that's really important for DPR. It's one thing for us as, as BASF or name your chemical company to tell DPR, hey, people want this. It's another thing when the grower groups, the commodity groups are going forward saying, we want this product and here's why we want it and how it's going to help the industry as a whole. That's a very strong message. And it even happens post-registration. So there's a normal 15-year review of products. This is just a normal EPA review. Our product, Pristine, came up. This has been around for a while. And I was getting hit up constantly by people from UC, commodity groups, especially in the grape sector, PCAs saying, hey, we heard this is going up for review. We like this product. We want to keep this product. How can we help? How can we get the message across to let EPA and, and Cal DPR know that this is an important product that we want to keep in the industry? And that's just a great collaboration. And that's really makes this stuff a lot smoother to move through. Even on top of that, when you look at, it's not just about new actives. We're working on over 80 uh, just label changes, whether a new use, a new rate, what have you. And 20, 20 or more of these are with the IR4 project. So these are, again, those minor uses of some of our products like Prowl that's been around for now 50 years. This is the 50th birthday of Prowl. I bet eight, out of 80 of those, about 20 of them are Prowl related. So we're still working on 50 year old products because there's still a key need for them. All the way going to our newest product, Sevia, which we're still expanding the label, still looking at new uses, new pests, new targets. So it all comes down to collaboration. Uh, we're an industry as a whole. We need to work together and really find the best pathway forward for some of these products to find its way into industry use of growers. Uh, we can pass it back to Mary. I think she has some closing comments around this presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Next slide, please. So he just shared opportunities to work together as an industry through labeling an IR4 to meet the needs of California agriculture. Another great way to be involved is through public comment and participation in public workshops. DPR requests public comments on proposed regulations for many types of decisions and actions. You can find these on DPR's website and sign up to receive emails about public notices. These are great opportunities to provide feedback to DPR and inform them of the critical need for new solutions and impact of their actions on California agriculture. The regulatory challenges are not getting any easier. It is increasingly important your voice be heard. Next slide. Today, we gave you an overview of the registration process and regulatory challenges. BASF is a resource for regulatory support and expertise. We support you on labeling opportunities, so please reach out. We can also support you on label interpretations and corrections to DPR database. We know our labels best. It is critical the agricultural community provide positive and informed feedback to the regulators. And we invite you to let us know what do you need from BASF to make informed comments on DPR actions and registration decisions. We also encourage feedback to DPR through and from industry and grower associations. Working together as an industry, we can find ways to collaborate and inform DPR on critical pest control needs they need to know. Kevin. I'll invite you if you have any closing comments you'd like to add. No, again, I think it just goes back to collaboration. I mean, we're one industry. It's not chemical manufacturers. It's not growers. It's not commodity groups. We're all a single industry. So that's it. I'll close it off with that. And I guess we'll pass it back to Sarah. Well, thank you, Mary and Kevin. Um, I think, Mary, your statement about the regulatory burden not getting any easier is really kind of an understatement because it's a lot of complex in issues that you explained to us just in that short amount of time. So thank you so much. And just a reminder to all of our participants, if you have questions, please enter those in the Q&A section. And then we're going to go to our next speaker, and that's Chris Reardon. He's the new Director of Government Relations for the California Farm Bureau. Previously, he was Executive Vice President of the Pest Control Operators of California. Before working with PCOC, he served as 
Chief Deputy Director for the Department of Pesticide Regulation, so he knows a lot of which we are speaking today. Before joining DPR, he was Executive Director of the Manufacturers Council of the Central Valley, and he also spent time working in the legislature. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from California State University, and we're really excited to have you with us here today, Chris. So the stage is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's uh, it's a pleasure pleasure to be here today, and in some ways, um, um, which isn't surprising, things haven't changed since I left in 2016, and um, it concerns me. Uh, and I wanted to just share, give you a perspective of how I think we, you know, as I look at so the registration process in California, I share a little bit about my background and sort of some of the things that I think are important to accomplish as we proceed forward. So the issue of duplicate registration has always been an issue, as you know, what goes, you know, both registering at, at uh, US EPA and California, I know has always been some frustration amongst the registrant community. And then secondly, the processing time in California. Uh, and part of our challenge, and I don't know how, how many of you know this, but in California, and by the way, even during my tenure, there was probably five, six times that we recommended um, additional staffing to deal with the issue of, of the registration process in California. And we call it the beat, for those of you on the phone or, or listening, might understand this in, in, in California government, but the BCP process, budget change proposals, and um, Part of our challenge within Cal EPA DPR as part of Cal EPA is you put in your budget change proposals, you're competing against ARB, the Water Board, uh, the Toxic um, Department of Toxic Substance Control, and OEA, et cetera. So then it's got to be approved by uh, agency Cal EPA, and then go to the governor's office to be approved as well. So oftentimes there's stiff competition to sort of get positions uh, approved. And so you all have to fight to ensure that you have the resources necessary to get the job done. And candidly on the registration side, uh, over the years, we, we, we put additional, try to get additional resources, technology, et cetera. But uh, when you're competing, also sometimes you just don't get what you want. So it, it takes some time in California. Some, I think Mary mentioned the first about staffing um, and staffing has always been an issue um, in the registration unit, always. Uh, and my understanding is still is to this day. So. I think it's an issue that, you know, particularly as I think about this out loud, uh, as part of the budget process, you know, as we go, folks like myself and other colleagues have to pay close attention to what's going on in the budget process as well in terms of uh, needs and wants and how maybe we can be helpful with the department ensuring they have the necessary resources um, to do what they need to do. Um, and that might be a discussion we have with budget subcommittee staff, et cetera, but it is a process. It's not something we can, the DPR can just do, say, by the way, we need additional monies for uh, staff, we need additional monies for technology, et cetera. It takes time and many and many of you know that as well. So I wanted to just point that out because it, it, it continues to be, I think, a some frustration, not only with most of the people listening, but probably with the Department of Pesticide Regulation as well. The other thing that I think is really important is uh, some time ago, the department used to have quarterly meetings with leadership with um, with the registration uh, leaders and talk a little bit about, we'd have a breakdown of sort of the processing times and packages, et cetera. I, I'm not sure if that still continues, but I think it's important because it, it invests the leadership of DPR to ensure that the process is working. And if it isn't working, why not? Um, and I would sure love to, I think it's important too that um, we as an industry, um, all of us engage in that process as, as well. And, and um, so th those quarterly updates um, for leadership at DPR are really, really important. Um, they should have real time understanding of, of what's going on as it relates to registration. Yes, there's a, lot of go there's a lot going on in the department for both the deputy and chief deputy, but this is an important issue of clients out there that are depending on you to do your job in a timely manner. Um, and, and DPR needs to do everything they, they can to ensure that happens. The other thing that's changed too over the years, um, and candidly, it probably started with the registration of methyl iodide is the legal review um, in terms of what's going on, what's going on in California uh, related to um, 
you know, the closing out of, of, of a package. Um, it, it's clear to me in the last probably decade, maybe just a little bit more that there is, you know, there is a keen intention on um, what goes on at the registration level, the DPR, folks are suing the department, they're paying active attention. Um, and it's something that when I first started DPR, while folks were paying some attention, not to the attention um, they are now. So it is also a process that I, I am sure um, has had some impact on the movement of material and packages out of, out of the department because they have to pay very careful attention to the legal implications of, of the registration of, of some of these materials. These all, there's, there's also some issues, and I think they were mentioned a little bit in, in the previous presentations, but, you know, in terms of, you know, there was frustrations with, you know, notifications because, you know, package, you had some typos and you had to return the package. And um, the issue of adjuvants, and, and, you know, can take up to a year to be registered. Why is that? Why are they spending all this time and effort on adjuvants? Um, then the, the, I think another issue that I think that might help, and by the way, we were uh, open to this some time ago, but this issue of implementation of a fee for service um, um, with respect to um, uh, registration packets, some registration packets, you know, sort of pay as, pay as you, um, if this is an important package, you want to get it done in a timely manner, you have to pay for it. I think most of you are aware that it's sort of done at the federal level, I think at PREA. Um, we actually talked about that. But again, this is some time ago. We talked about DPR, but my understanding also is there was some legal issues uh, because our budget process in California, you know, we have to account for all monies and without a clear understanding of who would apply for that material, it's pretty hard to prepare for. But there was a, there was legal issues uh, related to that as well. So, um, but I th but I think I, I think um, you know I think we have to be nimble today. I think that should be part of. If it was, you know, if I could wave my magic wand, I don't think it hurts, particularly on um, packages that I think you could, um, you know, negotiate with, the department could negotiate with stakeholders that um, you uh, might be able to work through the cost and the time frame. And by the way, you'd want to set time frame too to get it done, but have the adequate resource to pay the department to do that. To me, it makes some sense along with what, with what they're currently doing. Um, but I also understand some of the legal budgetary challenges as well. So. Um, in terms of process, I think that's important. Then one of the things that I want to chat a little bit about too, and it was talked about earlier, collaboration, um, it is some of you might know there has been pretty significant change in the department in the last probably three to four years. Um, and that's at all levels. That's at the you know director level, chief deputy level, at the assistant director level. Look, when I was there, most of the people that I worked with worked that previously worked um, or came up through the California Department of um, uh, agriculture department, as you know, it used to be before they moved it to um, Cal EPA, um, uh, it used to be in CDFA. I think it would be, I think it's really, really um, important um, to this the, on the issue of collaboration that we need to get folks um, uh, out in the field so they understand um, the challenges that we in agriculture face. I was just uh, at a demonstration, we had a, we had a drone, drone demonstration at uh, UC Davis on Rancho Russell Ranch that um, uh, one of our staff members at the Farm Bureau set up. There was literally 15 to 20 DPR people out there to, to look at this, the application of drones, future applications of drones in California. It was terrific. Cross section of, of people, uh, people understand that sort of, you know, this is where, you know, potentially some of our technology goes in the future. We're gonna have some autonomous equipment too that's gonna to be probably useful, but we really need to reinforce with sort of this sort of generational change in California, not only at the senior level, but at the, at the assistant director level, at the branch chief level, we really, really need to get people out, okay? We also need to make sure that as part of that, the people, it's the registration process. Sometimes we forget a DPR, we invite our leaders and our branch chiefs and stuff, but sort of the rank and file folks, because we have a bunch of new people at DPR, let's get them out in the field. Uh, let's get them out so they understand the importance of what we're trying to accomplish at DPR. So uh, I think we lose sight of that um, sometimes. And someone raised the issue in terms of, um, in terms of role of folk for those of us in ag. I, I always find it, you know, that we 
historically, when I was still with the department, when I was still a regulator, we used to talk to uh, Western Plant Health, and we used to talk and to uh, uh, talk to the pest control advisors quite a bit. Um, but I think also we we commodity groups, we associations, folks that represent the growers, farmers, uh, need to be uh, uh, engaged as well. Uh, because I think as we sit down and talk to the department and their leadership and all the folks that sort of are integral in making sure that we register register these materials, that they understand why this is important. So. Um, it, it just, it, it, I must tell you, I've, I've had some conversations over the last couple of years with, with the leadership, they're able people. Um, I, and I think you've given sort of the, um, our, our conversations, regular conversations with them about the importance of this materials, the technology materials, um, that are going to make it, you know, safer, easier, and more efficient for us, um, as an industry to help and feed uh, people in this great state. So anyway, that's a few, few of my comments. I'd be happy to answer questions too. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for those uh, very great comments about the process and what you've seen from your involvement at so many different levels, especially your past at, at DPR. Thank you for that. So um, next up, we're going to have our final presenter and then we will open it up for facilitated Q&A. Uh, from both our participants and a few questions from me. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Bristow, who is the treasurer of the California Association of Pest Control Advisors, or CAPCA. He currently works for Nutrien, a name that so many of you know across the country, great company, and he's based in Coachella. Um, in addition to his pest control advisors license, which he obtained in 2004, Matt's also a certified crop advisor, the major crops he consults on are vegetables and citrus, but also works with dates. I know there's a lot of those in the area, table grapes and alfalfa. He graduated from California Poly Pomona with a Bachelor of Science and a de degree in crop science. So Matt, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to uh, take part in this. Uh, really uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, and Today, I just want to kind of go over what a pest control advisor does and you know, why it is that I feel we really need to uh, have more chemistries available to us. Um, as the pest control advisor, I, I represent um, kind of the end user in the uh, chemical chain. Uh, my job is to go out and scout fields. Um, for me, it's a quite often mainly vegetable fields, fresh vegetables, uh, look for pests, identify you know, what the issue is. And if it's deemed that uh, the only way to solve it would be to utilize uh, some form of chemistry, pesticide, we, uh, we then meet with the grower and uh, decide how to uh, best go forward from there. Um, taking in uh, all the considerations uh, such as days to harvest, um, worker re-entry, uh, those types of things. Uh, and this is where uh, the newer, safer chemistries, I think, are really necessary. Um, the, uh, the pest control advisors want to use them. The growers want to use them. Uh, environmental justice communities want to see us transition to safer, greener chemistries. Uh, I think regulators want to see it happen. And most of all, the consumers uh, of these vegetables definitely want use, uh, the using safer chemistry. So I think there is a, a need. Uh, I think there's participation to be found on every level. And I think it's uh, imperative that, that we look forward to, you know, utilizing these. And while we have uh, uh, multiple options on the table now, um, as we go forward, uh, we're needing more and more uh, chemistries to be able to rotate and utilize uh, so that these more narrow focused chemistries 
um, can stay in play for a longer time. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty important for us to have those types of things utilized uh, in a safe manner. And the more tools we can have as a toolbox in the toolbox, pardon me, um, it's going to give us a, a longer uh, lifespan to these chemistries. And I think overall, um, the, the need uh, is, right now outweighs um, our ability to service uh, that. And having newer, <clears throat> having new registrations is really imperative. Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, DPR is probably, uh, you know, working as hard as they can uh, on a lot of these and just want to express that, you know, it's really, really necessary um, to, you know, bring these to the market. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. And now I'd like to bring all of our panelists back onto the screen so that we can have time for a little extra discussion. So let's uh, welcome everyone back, both Mary, Kevin, and, and Chris, if we can have you uh, join us here. And I see we're starting to get some questions that are coming in from the audience. But Kevin, I wanted to start with you, both you and Mary. Um, excellent slide deck there. I see we have a request for that already. So we'll be uh, reaching out to you on that. Uh, but you talked about 11 years for a product to come from lab to label. And you just think about anybody else in business these days, if they're going to invest hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars in research and chemistry and trying to develop these new safer products, but you've got 11 years before you can actually perhaps get it on the market in California. What does that say overall to the ability to invest in, in these new products and ag innovation in general? Well, and I, the, the price tag actually at one point, I think about six years ago, they said over 300 million. It's probably closer to 400 or 500 million now for a new active ingredient. And that's from lab the whole way to end user. Um, and certainly when we go to some of the, our specialty crops, let's just say lettuce, it's mostly in California and some in Arizona. So if you have a product that's very targeted to help Matt out, for example, in Coachella, that's $400 million in over 11 years to bring to market. So one of the things you see, like you saw in that chart, was a reduction in new active ingredients. I think the other thing that everyone's seen is the consolidation. Um, it's very difficult for a smaller company to invest that and sit on that on their books and have all their people wait around to start to be able to sell that product and recoup their investment. So it's not just a regulatory process. There's some other pieces that have made it longer, but it's a difficulty and it's, it's slowing down innovation in a time that I think we need it more so. And especially for some of these newer targeted softer chemistries, that's the direction we all wanna go anyway. Um, we just need a more streamlined process to get there and to know when, the, when is that deadline? Because when we hit a roadblock with some of the new processes, either at EPA or DPR, and they add another two or three years on, well, unfortunately, the higher ups in the accounting firm don't really like that. So it creates some difficulty even bringing these newer, softer chemistries to market. So it's, it's an issue, and there's not a great answer on how best to move forward as an entire industry to solve that. Thank you. And one of the things I just want to make sure all of our panelists and viewers of this keep in mind, we're not just talking about only conventional varieties here. Uh, we're talking about organic as well and the crop protection uh, products that are used on organic. Mary, um, talk a little bit about is there a difference between the struggles to, re to get registration for um, conventional versus organic products? Thank you, Sarah. Great question. All pest control products, including those for organic farming, go through the same registration process at DPR. So there is no difference between the process for conventional versus organics. BSF, we do have some products which are OMRI listed, and I have experienced similar delays in registration review for our, as for our conventional products. 
one of the challenges we face with biological products is demonstrating efficacy to meet DPR standards for product performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of new biologicals coming online, aren't there? Um, Chris, a uh, question that came in for you from Eric Flora wants to know if there's any move to drop or change the current adjuvant registration requirements. Uh, any background that you can offer on that? Uh, to be honest, I, I know it's been an issue for some time, but I don't have any background. I know it's been discussed, but I just mentioned it because it's it's been out there for a long time. So, I, But I'm not aware if there's any changes that are, at least they're thinking about right now. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other questions that came in is uh, asking whether or not there's you anticipate some improvements uh, in the approval process once CalPEST is operational. Does anybody want to offer up uh, any insight on what's ahead there? Sounds like there's, go ahead, Chris. No, no I was just going to say, Mary, I mean, the hope is yes. <laughs> that's, that's the reason why they're doing this. Um, and by the way, this has been thought about for the last 15 years, 16, maybe longer. So the hope is, yes, this process, it will speed up our the registration process in California. Yes, we do expect um, that it will speed up uh, review time, because if you can imagine now, all data is submitted um, in hard copy or um, and maybe an electronic copy on a CD, um, and it's very controlled. So if they have ability to access um, all of the documentation for a submission through a database program, that's going to make it much more efficient. And it just, you know, getting them out of that, um, you know, seeing pictures of the room at, at DPR, the, uh, the library, where all of the binders and binders and binders of data are housed. So we do expect to see some significant efficiencies once they have this in place. Thank you. Um, Matt, you mentioned the importance of having more than one tool in the toolbox. Obviously, you know, we can have a, um, we can have a lot of different challenges when we're trying to address pest control, right? I know I see that even on my my own farm, and it's things that might work at one time might not work on, on another uh, as well. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit more about why it's important to have that variety and, and that access for what uh, for growers on the ground that you're dealing with? Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, as we are transitioning into these newer chemistries, you know, the focus is, of those chemistries is, is getting uh, narrower, um, which is oftentimes a really great thing. You know, we're, we are having less issue with uh, the uh, harming the beneficial insects that we uh, try so desperately to, uh, to keep in. Um, we're able to have uh, you know much much closer um, applications when it comes to uh, people in the field, you know, farm workers. Uh, but with that narrowing, uh, also means that we're having to utilize them uh, sometimes more often. Uh, they as they are as they narrow, it also narrows the fit into the program and so uh having more tools to utilize throughout the season uh, enables us to uh, make them work specifically where they are designed to be um, the pests don't really care what your plan is and so we really need to be uh open and flexible um, and having more tools available allows us to do that. Uh, so I think uh, that's probably the, the biggest the biggest issue there. Thanks. And Kevin, can maybe you elaborate a little bit just about what are some of these newer chemistries that are coming online and, and, and how they are so much more efficient, targeted? Um, I know when I started my career back in 1980, we had a lot of, um, you know, broad acre solutions and and now the the chemistry and and just the precision in which they can be applied is so much better now share just a little bit about that 
Yeah, so a good example would be our new Safina insecticide or Versus in the vegetable market. It's the same active ingredient. Um, it's really just targeting piercing sucking pests. So it's not going to have you lepidoptera. It's not going to have any activity in your beetles. Whereas back in the day when Laura's ban or some of the OPs existed, you might just use one product, but you were also killing all your beneficials. There were big re-entry intervals, like Matt mentioned. There were some pre-harvest interval issues. There were other issues with those older chemistries that kind of that had lasting issues overall and some environmental issues, hence why some of them were taken away. Uh, but these newer chemistries are very targeted, but that also means, such as I'm sure Matt does this on a regular basis, he might have to spray an aphid product, a lep product, a beetle product, a downy mildew product, and a sclerotinial product, all in the same tank, because each one is targeting a different pest. So it seems like more pounds on the ground, but in reality, they're very targeted products that are very narrow spectrum for a reason, because overall the ecotox profile and everything else is much further and the human health profile. So really that when he's Matt's talking, he needs more tools. It's because it's so narrow spectrum, which ends up being a good thing for some of the different regulatory pathways. we call it. Terrific, thank you. Um, Chris, would you address a little bit about how growers can be more involved, especially some perhaps your California Farm Bureau members, getting them involved in the regulatory process. So we've talked quite a bit about the importance of collaboration and just showing up and, and also commenting. But I know some growers have been kind of turned off when activist groups show up at public hearings and can be, uh, well, I'll say downright rude, but it's more than that in many cases um, where it doesn't seem like a true public hearing where you can just be polite and share your opinion, you, you, you might get heckled. So so what, what do you say to your grower members that you want, hey, you need to show up because you know what, what can be the outcome if they don't? Well, if you don't, then there's nothing good that's gonna happen if, candidly. Um, Look, I think we did a notification workshop around the public uh, pesticide use around schools about six years ago. Um, and one of the things that we try to do at the time is we had separate, by the way, we brought in the school folks, we brought in uh, agriculture, then we brought in what I call the general public. We had separate meetings. And the reason we did that is we wanted a candid conversation with those stakeholders about the importance of sort of the, um, of the challenges re related to, um, at the time, uh, pesticide use around schools. Um, so, look, there's got to be an ability for agriculture uh, to have a conversation without being ridiculed, about people going after you, about people questioning um, the things that you're attempting to do. Um, and so uh, I think it's on the regulatory process, we need clearly to be engaged. I think as part of the discussion as we, as we Farm Bureau and other commodity groups meet with DPR, I think this should be an issue that we, we, um, we talk about, at least, hey, what's going on on the registration side? Issues been important to us. We collaborate as well, folks that are that are on this call today to talk about the important issues um, that, that we can under you know in terms of understanding the registration process, what's what's out there, what can we be helpful with. So there has got to be a discussion amongst all of us, not just the sort of silo discussions. I think that's gone on sort of historically. I'm not saying these discussions never happen, um, but I think it would be I think it would be advantageous to all of us to have sort of a collective. Um, uh, when we're talking to the department, sitting down with not only the registration folks, but you know our our leaders of DPR to talk about the importance of having materials. Um, and as you know, materials have changed today. They're more direct. They're safer. They're green. I can go on and on in terms. Of, so it's beneficial for everyone to to move these pro these uh, products through our process in California. So that's that's what I think. But in terms of when we have these discussions, people should be respected. There should be an understanding, okay, we should be respected um, in ways that um, they can be heard clearly. And, and my understanding is, is some of these last uh, hearings, uh, I don't think that occurred, and that's unfortunate. Any other thoughts from uh, Mary or, or Matt or Kevin about just how we can get more growers and, and PCAs involved in this collaborative process? I can say that uh, you know, as a as a you know infield PCA, um, you know if, if there are PCAs out there who want to be involved and feel like they don't have uh, a voice, you know, joining CAPCA uh, or if you're already a member of CAPCA, 
you know, uh, volunteering or finding time to engage, uh, you know, you, letting the uh, letting the big groups um, represent us, but also you know taking the time to be involved with those groups is a uh, is a great way. Thanks, Mary. Did you have something to add too? Yeah, I think just um, understanding what's going on in the registration side. And everything that's uh, submitted to DPR to enter to valuation and that is proposed to register is public notice. Um, so it, if there's something that you're aware of, a chemistry that you're aware of from, um, from the UC researchers or otherwise, um, you know it could be close to or under evaluation, you can find that out or reach out to um, the registrant. We can, we can certainly provide that information. And you know, write into DPR, provide them your feedback on what this new chemistry could mean to you. And if you need more information on what's going on there, please let BASF know how we can help. Thank you. Um, we've got just uh, five minutes left. And one of the things that I wanted to do is give you all just a quick minute to make any final comments before we wrap up. So Kevin, I'd like to start with you and just uh, if you could give us a brief uh, sort of here's the take home that you want our listeners to know as a result of this discussion about how we really do need to make progress in regulating and, and bringing new innovation on the market. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, it really comes down again to collaboration. I mean, we're one industry, we have to work together. And when it comes down to complaining that we don't have enough tools or the process is broken or no one's listening, you got to look at yourself in the mirror and you are the voice of ag. So you need to be involved. And in the end, similar to what Chris mentioned, we're everyone, we all want the same thing. We want a healthy, safe, affordable food chain that isn't having negative effects on the environment. That's, I mean, that's across the board. We all want the same thing. I think, unfortunately, many times we have different voices that different groups don't always understand. So trying to bridge those gaps is a really big step. There's no easy answer to do it, but the more we talk, the better chance we have of understanding one. Thank you. And you, I think you kind of answered a question just came in from a Kelly Chapman on that. So Mary, final thoughts? I'll just reiterate that, uh, you know, for the past 10 years, we keep looking for improvements in the process. Uh, DPR is trying hard. They have great staff working for them. Um, it's just not getting any easier. And so we have to have a different approach. We have to have an industry collaborative approach to get new, new products, get these, these safer, more effective, um, you know, preferred products into the rotation in California agriculture. And we're all gonna have to work together to do that. Thank you. And Matt, and, and then we'll turn to Chris to wrap up. Uh, final thoughts, Matt? Yeah, just to reiterate that, you know, I think that, as we get newer, safer, uh, more economically friendly products, um, or ecologically friendly products, um, and th the adoption rate is really quick. You know, pest control advisors want them and uh, they'll use them and uh, everyone will benefit. And I think that's uh, as close to a win-win as you can get. Thanks. Chris, last to you. Well, let, let me thank you again for inviting me um, to participate uh, this afternoon. Look, I, last thing I'd say is we talked collaboration. I maybe even sort of uh, put a dot on partnership. I think oftentimes there's been this sort of um, rub historically um, in terms of how the process works. And uh, I, I think maybe as we sort of proceed, uh, as we look to the future, maybe you know, sort of we can with the department understand as we just described, um, the challenges aren't going away. Um, we're, we face all sorts of issues. Um, and I think we want to accomplish a lot of the same things that the department wants to accomplish. So that's why I hope that we, we, we develop a partnership with them to talk about the importance and ways that we can more, be more effective trying to get at what they're trying to accomplish too in terms of um, getting safer material into the marketplace. And from our perspective, allowing our growers and our consumers to enjoy the bounty of, of California. So. Thank you. Well, thank you to Mary, Matt, Kevin, Chris. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Um, I know we'll continue to look for collaboration from all of you in the weeks and months ahead. 
And I'd like to tell our audience that in case you want to continue to stay on top of farm, food, and rural policy, please check out www.agri-pulse.com. That's our website. If you're not a subscriber, you can uh, sign on for a month-long free trial. And that's also where we're going to be hosting this webinar that was sponsored by our friends at BASF. So if you missed a portion of it today or you'd like to review it at a later time, share that conversation with your friends. Uh, we'll have that uh, webinar, this webinar up as a recording later today or early tomorrow, depending on how fast we can uh, move here. Uh, and at that time, if you're a participant, you also receive an email that it's available. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today and enjoy the rest of your, uh, not only your day, but the holiday season. God bless. Goodbye.